Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to uh, your daily briefing today on this Monday. I do not have any announcements at the top, so I'll go straight to your questions. Ben Feller of the Associated Press. Thanks, Jay. A couple questions on the Secret Service. Um, there's a report out that um, a member of the White House Communications Agency is now being investigated. Can you confirm whether that's accurate? Well, I would refer you to questions about military personnel to the Defense Department. As you know, uh, WACA, as we know it here, uh, is staffed entirely by military personnel, uh, not by White House staff. And uh, it is a defense logistics agency. Uh, and uh, for everyone involved in the Defense Department's investigation of members of the military as related to this incident, I would refer you to the uh, Defense Department just as uh, for uh, matters involving the Secret Service investigation into Secret Service personnel, we refer you to the Secret Service. There's, a, as you know, a broader White House a military office in Washington is underneath that, as you say, that's composed of military members, but it is you know, widely seen as part of the White House apparatus. Are so you saying that that but is then there are, there are, let's, let's just be clear, these are military personnel staffed by the military. They are not members of the White House staff. They are not chosen by uh, the White House uh, uh, senior staff. Uh, they are no more members of the White House staff than Secret Service personnel who you see every day uh, on the grounds here are members of the White House staff. Uh, as is appropriate, personnel actions, investigations and otherwise, uh, uh, that uh, affect members of the military are handled by the Defense Department, and I would refer you to the Defense Department for uh, questions regarding that. Um, are you still comfortable in your statement that, to your knowledge, no one other than members of the Secret Service or the military then are being uh, looked at? Well, I can tell you a, a couple of things that, uh, well, first of all, to make clear, the Secret Service is investigating specific uh, allegations of misconduct by members of the Secret Service. The Defense Department is investigating specific allegations of misconduct by members of the military. There have been no uh, specific, credible <coughs> allegations of misconduct by anyone on the White House advance team or the White House staff. Uh, nevertheless, out of due diligence, uh, the White House Counsel's Office has conducted a review of uh, the White House advance team and uh, in concluding that review came uh, uh, to the conclusion that uh, there is no indication that any member of the White House advance team uh, engaged in any uh, improper or uh, conduct or uh, behavior. Uh, so simply out of due diligence, over the last several days, that review was conducted, and it produced no indication of any uh, any uh, misconduct. Okay, uh, I'm glad I asked. The um, uh, on the comment over the weekend from Senator Lieberman um, talking about one member of the Secret Service who stayed at the hotel where the president eventually stayed. Um, this would obviously happen before the president got there. Mm -hmm. um, but the quote was, now you're in the hotel where the president of the United States was going to stay, and it just gets more troubling. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that line of thinking, or is, is that overstated? Well, I think the incident itself is troubling. Uh, the allegations that we've seen are troubling. The investigation uh, in, in both cases, both uh, the Secret Service investigation and the Defense Department investigation, they are both ongoing. So. Uh, as was the case last week, uh, I'm not going to make any broad uh, statements or about our assessment of it, its, it's broader meaning, what uh, uh, you know, steps, further steps that might need to be taken uh, once the investigations are concluded. Uh, it's, it's, it's too early for that. The, the, the investigation, of speaking now specifically about the Secret Service, obviously uh, began right away, uh, is ongoing, but has produced results, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, personnel who have uh, been separated or separated themselves from the agency. Um, but uh, those broader questions about uh, what it all means, if you will, uh, for the agency and, and its mission, I think, uh, are better left until the specific incident itself is uh, thoroughly investigated. Yes? Thanks. Um, the uh, Sonoga refinery, which is the largest on the East Coast, has announced that uh, its summer closure will be delayed for by a month, if not longer, not all together, and, and, that this, and the, the view is that this could help ease um, gasoline prices. Um, does the administration think that gas prices may have peaked, um, and if so, to what extent could that be a boost for the economy? Well, 
I would hesitate to make any predictions about global markets, including global oil markets. So I won't engage on the question about which direction gas prices might go. Uh, regarding uh, the specific question that you began with, we are continuing to monitor closely the refinery situation on the East Coast, including the potential impact that disruptions could have on consumers in the region. Um, but beyond that, I wouldn't comment on uh, the specific refinery that, you're, that you mentioned. One other question. The, the Ch a Chinese manufacturer, Hubei Sanjiang, has been implicated in supplying parts for a large missile transporter vehicle that North Korea showcased in its um, military parade last week. Um, how concerned is the U.S. about this, and, and how is the administration con conveying its concern to, the chi to China that it may not be doing enough to, to enforce sanctions against military-related sales to Pyongyang? I'll say two things about it. One, the United States will continue to work uh, with the international community, including China, to enforce sanctions against North Korea's ballistic missile program and nuclear program. And uh, I would say that we've raised the allegations with the Chinese government that you mentioned as part of the ongoing, uh, our ongoing close consultations on North Korea. Has, has there a question made that China uh, I, I can only say that we've, that we've raised, uh, raised the situation, the allegations. Okay. On Syria, uh, there have been reports that the uh, opposition is running out of ammunition uh, while, of course, the Syrian government uh, enjoying relationships with Iran and Russia uh, does not have that problem. Uh, is it time, finally, uh, for uh, the international community or for the United States more specifically to, to seriously consider arming uh, the rebels there? Or do you think, does the President think that the Annan plan still needs time to try to work itself out? Well, as you know, we voted in favor of the uh, UN supervision mission in Syria, uh, the vote establishing that and expanding it. Um, and we believe it can help decrease the violence and lay the foundation for Syria's political transition. Uh, but we are sober about the risks and very clear-eyed about Assad's behavior uh, with regard to the Anon mission and its failure to um, fully commit to a ceasefire or honor the uh, other provisions of uh, the plan, the Anon plan. Um, we still do not believe that cons contributing to the militarization of Syria is the right course of action at this time. We are working with our partners and allies as part of the Friends of Syria, but also with the United Nations, uh, to further isolate and pressure Assad uh, and to uh, make clear to everyone that siding with Assad is making uh, a bad choice, uh, a, a choice that uh, will not wear well uh, as time passes because Assad has brutally murdered his own people. His regime will come to an end. Uh, it's a matter not of if but when. We believe that the measures we're taking, working with the international community, assisting the opposition establish itself providing humanitarian and other non-lethal aid to the Syrian people uh, is the right course of action to take. Uh, but there is no question that Assad's brutality uh, has, not abate, or has not ceased, even a, as it has abated at times during the course of the implementation of the Anon Plan. Uh, in response to the President's speech this morning and the, announcement and, and the discussion of the Atrocities Prevention Board, um, Senator John McCain uh, suggested that there was a, a, very, a great significance of similarity between um, Bosnia during the Clinton era and Syria today, and that uh, in his view, thankfully, uh, President Clinton came around uh, to arming uh, the victims, the, the opposition uh, in the former Balkans, and that hopefully the President would, uh, President Obama would step up and do the same. Does President Obama consider there to be any similarity? Well, I have not seen Senator McCain's comments uh, making that comparison to Bosnia, so I, and I haven't had that conversation with the President. I think that the President is extremely concerned about uh, the appalling uh, brutality that Assad has perpetrated on his own people. He has made clear, as have I and others, uh, when we talk about the actions that we can take uh, in uh, response to different situations in different countries, that there is not a cookie-cutter approach, that the actions we were able to take uh, when Qaddafi's forces were on the verge of overrunning Benghazi and uh, in his own words, uh, killing the residents of Benghazi, the Libyan people there, uh, that we were able to, uh, because of a broad consensus uh, and a very specific uh, 
mission that was uh, open to us uh, take direct action that prevented the um, overrunning of Benghazi and eventually uh, prevented Gaddafi from taking over the country again. So uh, the President said today at the Holocaust Museum in his speech that uh, we cannot, we have to do everything we can to prevent these kinds of atrocities. It does not mean that uh, in response to every action, uh, n using our military is the right answer. Uh, we cannot do that and we should not do that in response to every action. There are other tools that we have and we have to use them. And uh, right now that is the case uh, with regards to Syria and that's the approach we're taking. Nora? Uh, in terms of the White House Counsel's uh, mm -hmm. investigation, how long did that go on for? When did it begin? Interviews? It began on Friday and uh, had concluded uh, over the weekend. The, um, this again, I think it's important to note, there the incident we're talking about here uh, involved specific alle allegations of misconduct by the Secret Service, by members of the Secret Service, and members of the military. Um, the decision to conduct a review was uh, here internally was simply done out of due diligence. Uh, there are no, to my knowledge, and have been no uh, credible or specific allegations of misconduct by any member of the White House advance team or uh, White House staff. But out of due diligence, this review was conducted, uh, and there is no indication that, uh, of any misconduct uh, by members of the White House advance team or staff. And how many interviews did that entail? No, I don't have, uh, and I'm not going to, you know, give you a blow-by-blow blow of uh, what uh, was uh, involved in the review. I can simply tell you that, again, not because of any specific allegation of misconduct, not because of uh, any credible allegation at all, uh, out of due diligence, the White House Counsel's Office led this review and it produced no indication of any uh, inappropriate behavior or misconduct. Was this in response to Senator Grassley's letter inquiring about? No, it was a decision to simply uh, act uh, with you know, due diligence and uh, you know, out of an abundance of caution to, to, to do this review. Uh, not again, not because there's any, there, you know, there are specific things that happened that we know that happened that led to the revelation of this uh, incident. There are specific individuals involved in the investigation by the Secret Service, of the Secret Service, in the investigation of military personnel by the Depart Department of Defense. Uh, it was in the context of a presidential trip, and out of due diligence, this review was conducted. And, and again, I think I made the point that it, uh, there is no indication of any uh, misconduct. It's concluded. The review is now concluded. Yes, it's concluded. Yeah. And then let me just ask you about another uh, story. The um, GAO is coming out with a new study today, a new report, that Medicare is wasting more than $8 billion on this experimental program that rewards providers, it says, of um, mediocre health care. Um, it's not producing the kind of results. It's a waste of money and should end. Do you agree with that? Any comment on it? Well, I would say that before the Affordable Care Act, private insurance companies received Medicare payments that were too high and had nothing to do with the quality of care. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, the new health care law, we are on track to cut $200 billion in unwarranted payments. Uh, this was uh, uh, a much focused upon element of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Medi Medicare continually monitors its programs to ensure they are achieving their goals, and the temporary demonstration program that you're referring to is important to identifying ways to improve the quality of care in Medicare advantage. And since we're on the subject, I would call your attention to a report from CMS today indicating that the health care law will save the Medicare program over $200 billion through 2016. Additionally, people with Medicare will save nearly $208 billion thanks to the new law. Can I just follow on that? Sure. My understanding is that under the Affordable Care Act that Congress cut Medicare payments <clears throat> to these managed care plans known as Medicare Advantage, as you pointed out. Um, and then authorized these bonus payments to <coughs> provide high quality care. But the investigators with the GAO found that, in fact, the bonuses went to average performing plans. Well, I so understand what the, what, what the report says, but, but let's put it in context here. One, we think that the demonstration project that you're referring to uh, program is important to identifying ways to improve the quality of Medicare Advantage. Well, one of the things we found in uh, the uh, policy 
process that led to the Affordable Care Act is that Medicare Advantage, uh, that there could be uh, significant savings from Medicare Advantage because of overpayments. And in fact, uh, we're phasing out over $200 billion in overpayments to Medicare Advantage plans on schedule. Um, before health care reform, everyone with Medicare, even those who weren't in a Medicare Advantage plan, paid higher premium premiums to support those Medicare Advantage programs, so those overpayments, rather. So uh, the context here is one of uh, squeezing savings out of Medicare Advantage programs, uh, reducing overpayments through these programs. And this demonstration project is simply a, a way to, we believe, uh, ensure that these programs are as cost efficient as possible. Uh, let me move around a little bit. Mark? Jay, did uh, White House Counsel launch the review on her own authority? Yes. She was it instructed by uh, Chief of Staff or the President? Well, it the President, no, but uh, I, this, was in, this was led by the White House Counsel's office. It was the decision to do it was uh, certainly she has the authority to do this, but it was in consultation with the Chief of Staff's office, yes. And those questioned were White House staffers that were part of the advance team? Uh, or all White, all White House advance team. All White House advance team. Right. Uh, when the president met with uh, Director Sullivan, I mean, again, without getting the specifics of what the review entailed, it was a review of the White House advance team and those you people on it. No, I was not in Columbia in advance of the president's right, arrival. Right, I, I, right. I got there when he did. When, when the president met on Friday with Director Sullivan, did uh, the director offer his resignation? No. Laura, and then uh, um, I have a couple questions about the executive order this morning. The first is, why is it limited to just Iran and Syria? Why not? There are other um, countries that use technology to suppress <coughs> attacks to su in a variety of human rights abusive, abusive ways. So why is it limited to those two countries? Well, I think I would take that in two ways. First, I can, I can get back to you with more specifics about the narrow focus. One obvious reason is we have a circumstance where the uh, use of technology to suppress human rights is very clear and evident by these two regimes. Uh, and uh, the EO degrades the ability of the Syrian and Iranian governments uh, to acquire and utilize technology to oppress their own people. It sends a clear message that the U.S. recognizes and is committed to combating this new and growing human rights threat. It holds accountable those government officials, companies, and individuals committing or facilitating human rights abuses and as part of that process further isolates both Damascus and Tehran. So you're, you're certainly right that unfortunately in, in this world these are not the only regimes that uh, oppress their people or use technology to do it, but these are specific cases that we are focused on right now that this EO can have a direct impact on. So you're focused on these because it's very clear and evident in these cases, but not as clear Again, and evident I Again, I, I can work with you uh, and, and get more information for you on on the decision behind focusing the EEO on uh, these two bad actors, uh, but I don't think there's any disagreement uh, really anywhere outside perhaps of those regimes themselves that these are two bad actors. The other question is, does this have any impact on companies that supply this technology directly to these governments? There's a, a lot of examples of cases where you've had companies perhaps knowingly sell technology used to do this. I'll have to get back to you on, on the implementation of the EO and what its uh, impacts and ramifications are. Uh, I know there's, there are designations involved uh, with the EO, similar to other sanctions and things that we've done, but I don't, I, in terms of the companies involved, I'll have to get back to you. Okay. Thanks. Ed and Kristen. Thanks, Jay. I just wanted to go back to Medicare, um, Nora's question about Medicare. Uh, what Republicans have said about this bonus program is that it's <coughs> warning folks because it's trying to kind of mask other cuts to Medicare from the President's health care uh, reform plan. And you say to that, because you answered it with a question about overpayments and whatnot, that's not really what Republicans are alleging, that these bonuses are covering up the fact there are cuts elsewhere in Medicare. It's sort of making up for other cuts the President put in in his health care plan. Well, we've been highly transparent about the savings that are produced because of the Affordable Care Act. The, as uh, described by the CBO, the significant deficit reduction brought about by the Affordable Care Act after 10 years and the truly substantial deficit reduction uh, created in the second decade uh, after implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, 
the savings that are part of that are very important. But this is not, this is a Medicare Advantage, as you know, uh, prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, had uh, a big problem with overpayments that the Affordable Care Act addressed and has, will bring about a reduction of $200 billion in overpayments as part of the overall uh, Affordable Care Act, the, the, as part of the Affordable Care Act's overall treatment of Medicare Advantage plans, this demonstration project, we believe, uh, is important to um, increasing the efficiency of the Medicare Advantage plan. So, you know, we just have a disagreement about this, I think. More broadly on Medicare, I know Secretary Geithner is going to be talking, I think, in a few minutes about the trustees' report, but more broadly, um, the early reports have suggested that Medicare is going broke faster than expected, maybe as early as 2018. I know he's going to address the details, but how does the President go to voters this year and say that he's protecting senior citizens if Medicare is going broke faster than people expect? Well, again, I don't, I don't want to get in uh, ahead of uh, the trustees' report, but I think the President's approach has been from the beginning when it comes to deficit reduction and the need to reform entitlements in a way that both ensures the guarantee uh, remains for our seniors through Medicare and Social Security, uh, but uh, stabilizes our deficit and debt. I mean, that is the approach he's taken with every uh, negotiation he's had with uh, members of Congress, leaders in Congress on deficit reduction. And, and you know, what I can tell you is the President's approach remains what it was last summer and what it is, uh, you know, what it was in the fall when he put forward his plan, which is that we need a balanced approach. One way we can ensure that we make we maintain our commitment to seniors through Medicare and through uh, Social Security is not to uh, cut them so substantially in order to give more tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans. We don't need to do that. We, if we take a balanced approach to deficit reduction, uh, we can, as the president uh, has proposed and 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 uh, as he has. The position he took in his negotiations with uh, members of Congress, leaders of Congress, you know, if we uh, cut discretionary, non-defense discretionary spending, which uh, he has done and signed into law to bring uh, that spending uh, to its lowest level uh, since the Eisenhower administration, if we uh, cut our tax expenditures, if we reform our tax code in a way that uh, increases revenue, uh, and then we reform our entitlements in a way that preserves the guarantee, uh, we can uh, make huge strides towards getting our deficits and debt under control without doing it on the backs of senior citizens well, and the most vulnerable. The report said vulnerable. Medicare was going broke in like 2024. Now it says it's going broke in 2018. So doesn't it sound like everything you just said is not really working because it's going broke? Well, uh, part of why it hasn't worked yet is because uh, Republicans in Congress refuse to accept the basic premise that we need to take a balanced approach to our deficit and debt reduction. They are out there telling the American people through the Ryan Republican budget uh, that we need to dramatically cut taxes on the wealthiest Americans, dramatically, and we will pay for that in large part by gutting discretionary spending programs, investments in education and innovation and basic research uh, in infrastructure, and by uh, ending welfare, I mean Medicare as we know it, ending Medicare as we know it by basically turning it into a, a, a two-tiered uh, system, uh, you know, that's half privatized through vouchers, uh, that results in uh, the uh, healthiest seniors uh, gravitating towards one system and the, and, and the sickest, oldest seniors in the other, which, which basically ends the program and the guarantee as we know it. And none of that is necessary. If you do not accept the premise, I mean, if, if you do accept the premise, uh, that we need to take a balanced approach. So. I certainly hope, and the President hopes, that um, under pressure from their own constituents, Republicans will reconsider their refusal uh, to adopt a balanced approach, uh, the same approach that every bipartisan commission that's looked at, us, uh, at this has endorsed, uh, the same approach that uh, not just Democrats, but independents and Republicans across the country endorse. Uh, the only outliers here are elected members of Congress of the Republican persuasion. Last thing on Columbia, did the White House counsel check the hotel records down in Columbia to see if any White House advance or White House staff I don't, had I'm not going to get into the specifics. Uh, I would simply uh, say that the uh, review that the White House uh, counsel oversaw uh, and led uh, produced no indication of any misconduct. And the, again, I'm not going to get into, or do they check not get into specifics of it. And what I also won't do is engage in uh, speculation about so specific. there is no Secret specific. Has been checking hey Ed, down do you there. have a specific allegation? I'm just saying, did they check? Because there has been no specific allegation of misconduct 
And again, I'm not going to get into all the details of the review, well, except to say that. Yes, they did, and there was nothing there. I'm not, because I am not going to describe every aspect of this review. I will simply say that the review has been conducted. Uh, there is no indication of any misconduct by any member of the uh, White House advance team. Three on. Okay. Um, on this. Oh, yeah. uh, sorry. You're next. Sorry, I did say you. Brianna, go ahead. Um, outside of the White House, who will you provide details of this review to? Can I just make clear? We have an incident where there were specific allegations of misconduct by members of the Secret Service. Specific allegations of misconduct by members of the military. And there are investigations into both those matters by the Defense Department and the Secret Service. There is no allegation of misconduct by anyone on the White House advance team or staff. Been concerned by, um, no, there's been rumors published on the internet by people with no editors and no conscience, but there is no, there is no specific allegation of any kind of misconduct here, and only out of due diligence uh, have we conducted this review, which, re which revealed what we thought to be the case, which there was no misconduct by members of the. Uh, from Republicans also, Senator Lieberman felt that the scope should be. I'm just wondering. Right, and what I'm saying is that in. the review has been conducted, and there's there's no indication of any 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 but misconduct. I'm just trying to be clear. So it's mm -hmm. purely for internal White House consumption. Again, look, what I can say, if someone comes to us with some credible allegation that anybody uh, at the White House was involved in any inappropriate conduct, I'm sure that we'll look at it. But there there isn't that. There is some attempt by some to. Uh, throw rumors out there, but again, there's no, we had specific behavior that led to this investigation, specific actions that led to the uh, investigation by the Secret Service and by the Defense Department of their personnel. Uh, we conducted a review simply out of due diligence of our people, White House advance team, uh, and it produced nothing. So I think that, you know, that's, that's where we are right now. Receive regular updates from Director Sullivan? Uh, well, I don't know about Director Sullivan. We are in contact uh, regularly with the Secret Service uh, about the investigation, and I'm sure that um, he'll be briefed accordingly. I don't have any meetings or conversations with between the President and the Director to preview for you. Okay. And then um, Egypt canceled its natural gas deal with Israel. Mm -hmm. In 2005, Egypt and Israel described the deal as enhancing peace and stability in the Middle East. How does the White House view this development? Well, we've seen reports of, uh, of that nature, and we're uh, seeking more information. Uh, I think it's important to note these are private companies, and I'd refer you to the companies involved for more details. Or They're, they're companies, they're not governments. Um, I, it's important to note that both Egypt and Israel ha have both said they remain committed to their uh, peace treaty. And as we've made uh, clear uh, in abundance, we strongly support the peace treaty and the Egypt-Israel relationship. What do, you, what do you see it, though, as an indication of? I mean, are you prepared to Well, I would point, when we talk about uh, peace treaties between nations, and in this case, a peace treaty between two nations, we look to the governments uh, for what they say about them. And both Israel and Egypt have uh, said that they remain committed to that peace treaty and, and the two companies involved, uh, the action that was taken by uh, it, with regard to this matter involves two companies and I would refer you to those companies for more details. I mean, it's seen as a breach of an agreement. It's not seen, it's widely well, again, seen but as there, something this to be is a, This is an agreement about. between two companies, not an agreement between two governments. Roger, uh, Kristen, sorry, then Roger. Um, if the White House review started Friday, why are we just learning about it today? Why not announce it Friday and say? Well, we're Kristen, it's, a, it's an internal due diligence review. It's not, you know, this is, the, the, there, there are a lot of things that, that, you know, well, let me just say, specific allegations of misconduct by the Secret Service, specific allegations of misconduct by members of the Department of Defense, specific investigations accordingly. As a matter of due diligence, we, we have taken a look at our personnel uh, who were involved in the President's trip to Columbia. White House advance personnel who were there in advance of the President, uh, and uh, there are no, there's no indication of any uh, misconduct uh, by them. So uh, I think a couple of days to conduct this review and reach that conclusion is pretty, you know, both enough time and uh, hardly a long time. And going back to the 
Going back to the President's meeting with Director Sullivan, can you give us a sense of the tone of that meeting? Well, I'm not going to get into uh, details about specific meetings or conversations the President has in, in, in the Oval Office. I, I think you can – you would not be surprised if, if I told you that uh, it's a serious matter and so it was a serious discussion. But uh, beyond that, I can't, I can't really describe it. Explain why it took the director a week to brief the president. Was that because the investigation was going I on? I think I told you daily when you asked me that the president was being kept uh, updated on uh, the Secret Service investigation and this matter, uh, that the director himself was uh, personally in contact with senior members of White House staff, and members of senior members of White House staff were in contact with other senior members of the uh, Secret Service. So there was plenty of communication happening. Uh, the president has a lot on his plate. This is an issue that warrants investigation, uh, and it is being investigated appropriately. But it is not something that is, uh, you know, his highest priority. He's he's dealing with uh, trying to keep our economic recovery going, trying to help the economy uh, continue to create jobs as it has done now uh, for 25 straight months, and uh, working to ensure that our national security interests are are, uh, are protected. So. He's been appropriately briefed. He met to be briefed directly by the Secret Service Director on Friday, and he'll continue to be briefed uh, appropriately. And I'll just say, uh, Senator Susan Collins said this weekend that Secret Service Supervisor Paula Reed, who we all read about this weekend, acted decisively and appropriately in Cartagena, and I can't help but wonder if there had been more women as part of that detail if this ever would have happened. Is there a point there? Should there be more women as part of the Secret Service? Well, I, I would simply say, as I did earlier, that assessments of the institution, culture, broader questions about uh, the mission, I think, need to be uh, held in reserve while this investigation into a specific incident uh, is completed. Uh, and in many ways, I think that those questions uh, will be looked at broadly, but also specifically by the Secret Service, as, as is appropriate. But I, so I don't have a comment specifically to that uh, beyond what I've said. Victoria? I understand you can't necessarily speak to that, but if, if the percentage of women in the Secret Service is indeed 11 percent, you can speak to that, correct? Again, I, I can't. I'm not familiar even with that figure. I would simply say that uh, questions about the mission, the institution, uh, broader questions about the Secret Service that arise from this incident and this investigation, I think, at least from here, uh, I will uh, resist answering because it's not appropriate while this investigation is ongoing. And I think that you know, those questions in many ways uh, will be and should be addressed to the Secret Service itself, but, it, but they are focused on uh, this investigation into this incident at this time. And, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to make uh, broad observations about the institution during this period. Would you agree that if that figure is correct, it's really, it's very low? Well, again, I don't, you're saying if that figure is correct, what do I think about it? I don't know that figure to be correct or incorrect. I, uh, well, so you're talking about 11 percent as a percentage. Well, again, it's, it's, it's a law enforcement agency. I don't know how that compares to other law enforcement agencies. I would uh, simply ask that, uh, you know, you, you can ask the questions, but I, I would ask for understanding for why I'm not going to make uh, broad assessments of the institution itself, its mission, its culture, uh, while this specific investigation is going on. Um, sorry, uh, Scott and April. I mean, Roger, did I call on you and, didn't, and then I didn't? Okay. Uh, Roger, Scott, April. Thank you. Uh, there was a story over the weekend in the New York Times about Walmart uh, store officials in Mexico uh, allegedly bribing local officials to get stores open faster. Mm -hmm. Is this, uh, do you have any comment, number one, and is this uh, uh, something that the U.S. government would have an interest in? I think, uh, I mean, I read the story, but beyond that, I don't have a comment. Uh, and, and I'm not even sure uh, that it's an issue that we would be involved in. So uh, I would refer you to Walmart for now. Scott. Uh, Director Sullivan's briefing of the President on Friday, was the General Counsel in that meeting? The General Counsel of the Secret Service? White House General Counsel. Oh, the White House Counsel? Uh, I'll have to, to, to take that question. I don't believe so, but I can find out. Another question. The, uh, apparently, one of the agents that's been implicated uh, said to have taken a woman back to his room at the hotel where the president was was staying five days before he arrived. But that hotel does that raise your concerns over the president's safety? Uh, 
I, I got a version of this question earlier. I, I, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of uh, the allegations uh, against any of the individuals involved. I will say, as uh, the President said, I believe, or I said, I know, uh, that uh, pointing to the Secret Service that they have uh, said that the, neither the President nor his party's security was ever compromised because of this incident. Um, we know we depend on, the President depends on, any President depends on, uh, the Secret Service uh, for protection and security. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important to note that what the President said and I have said that uh, you know, we have great uh, respect for and admiration for those agents who on a daily basis uh, put their lives on the line to protect the President of the United States and his family. Uh, and uh, it's very hard work, and the President appreciates what they do. Uh, this is an incident that absolutely merits investigation, and action needs to be taken uh, when allegations of misconduct prove to be true. Uh, but it is also true that the work that they do is extremely important not just to the individual, but to the institution of the presidency, to our democracy. Uh, and it is hard work, and it is dangerous work. April. A couple of issues. Um, getting back to uh, the president's speech this morning, uh, he's outlined the Atrocities Prevention Board. With that, um, has there been any movement on U.S. action, potential action or possible action, as it relates to the Sudan? I asked you last week, and I'll follow up. Well, the President, I would point you to the President's remarks about uh, the Sudan and, and South Sudan, the, the creation of a new nation, uh, an effort that we were very much a part of, uh, the ongoing diplomatic efforts to uh, try to bring about stability between those two nations and in the region. Uh, I don't have anything more specific for you on that uh, as it relates to the Sudan. Did you ever find out if you talked to Chinese officials about their efforts to try to help bring peace? In between northern and southern I'll have to, again, April, I apologize. I'll have to take that. All right. And, and in a request for transparency, could you at least tell us, yes or no, straight up or down, mm -hmm. if advanced White House advance officials who were on the ground in Cartagena, were they interviewed by the White House counsel? Yeah, I, I don't think it, it's uh, useful to get into the details of how that review was conducted. I think that. Uh, that's a, that's 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 a, what, what, through what modalities the review was conducted, if you will. The uh, uh, the what you suggested stands to reason, but you know I don't want to get go get into thing something where uh, you know well they did that, did they do this, did they do that? There was a review conducted. There was no allegation that led to the review. There was a review conducted, uh, and the result is uh, there is no indication of any misconduct by White House. Uh, members of the White House advance team. So what I just asked stands to reason. Are you saying yes, they were interviewed? <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is I don't want to get into, there, there, there's no point in getting into the details of this internal review except to say that it was conducted, uh, that the uh, results of that uh, are that there is no indication of um, misconduct uh, by members of that team. Steve. Um, North Korea has, uh, Threatened to take specific military action against Seoul and presently. Is this just the normal propaganda and a demand for attention, or is there any reason to fear that this might be a sort of precursor to any military action similar to the shelling of the island a few years ago? Well, North Korea, the regime there is certainly known for uh, its provocative acts. It is known for uh, engaging in provocations uh, in a series. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, rule out provocative behavior by the North Korean regime. I, the specific uh, claim made, I, I, uh, I don't have a reaction to, uh, except that uh, you know, behavior by the North Korean regime has resulted in uh, international condemnation, has resulted in uh, our inability to move ahead with the nutritional assistance program that we had discussed uh, moving forward with because we cannot um, provide that assistance uh, with any assurance that it would get to the right people because of the lack of credibility in the behavior of the North Korean regime. Um, so uh, what is absolutely the case is that provocative behavior by the North Korean regime 
does nothing to feed its people. In fact, it does the opposite. It does nothing to grow that economy. In fact, it does the opposite. It does nothing to uh, reduce the isolation of that regime from the rest, rest of the world. In fact, it does the opposite. There is a door open to Pyongyang, a door open to that regime if it chooses to walk through it, which is to renounce its nuclear weapons program, uh, to abide by United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, and to um, reenter the community of nations. We uh, would very much welcome if they took that step. Olivia. Uh, a couple, one on the, on the Syria uh, executive order. Um, how committed is the president to going after Western companies that provide the regime in Damascus with the kind of surveillance uh, technology that he discussed today? You know, I got a version of this question earlier, and I will have to, uh, to get more specifics for you on it. And uh, uh, on Afghanistan by way of France, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the front-running <laughs> candidate there wants uh, French forces out by the end of this year. Um, is that something that the president's strategy on Afghanistan can, can overcome? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the French election, as you might imagine. The, uh, we're working with all our partners in Afghanistan, in ISAF, uh, in NATO. Uh, Afghanistan will obviously be a, uh, a focal point of the discussions at the NATO summit in Chicago. The, as you know, uh, we are closing in on finalizing a strategic partnership agreement with the Afghan government. Uh, which is an important step towards uh, the future for our involvement, for our drawing down of our forces and standing up of Afghan security forces as they take uh, security lead in 2014, uh, and in ensuring that we have a long-term partnership with the Afghan government. Uh, with regards to specific countries and their commitments, I think uh, we should wait for Chicago for the NATO summit. Uh, and certainly for the election results. Yes. Thanks, Jim. Now that the president used the Holocaust Museum to bring more attention to what's happening in Syria, how long is he willing to wait for the Kofi Annan plan to do something before deciding that a direct intervention is needed to stop uh, history from repeating itself in Syria? Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the question. I think I would point to one of my previous answers, which is that we uh, are very clear-eyed about the failure of Assad to uh, abide by the points of the Kofi Annan plan in full, uh, very clear-eyed about uh, the continued violence being perpetrated by the Assad regime. We support the uh, monitoring mission of the United Nations, uh, but we understand uh, the sobering challenge it represents in the atmosphere that has been created by the Assad regime. I don't have a timetable for you uh, to discuss contingencies. What I can say is that it is our position uh, that we need to work with our partners and allies to continue to pressure and isolate the Assad regime, to make clear to everyone uh, internationally that siding with the Assad regime is a folly uh, because uh, Assad will go down as a brutal dictator who brutally murdered his own people, uh, not the kind of friend you really want in the world. And uh, we will continue to work with the United Nations and with the Friends of Syria and all uh, other partners in providing assistance to the Syrian people, to uh, helping the opposition uh, function and organi organize itself and function more efficiently, and isolating and pressuring uh, the Assad regime. Bill Press. And then Leslie. Uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina today, the trial of John Edwards got underway. It's being led by the Department of Justice. Why is this a priority for the administration? I would refer you to the Department of Justice, Bill. Well, yeah. This can follow. This started under the Bush administration, so there had to be a conversation with the Attorney General whether or not to continue the trial or not. Mm -hmm. Do you know if the president was involved in that discussion with him? Again, I, I, I don't, and I think this is a matter for the Justice Department. Leslie, did you have some? Uh, yeah, and it's sort of along the lines that Laura was asking about on the um, Syria and Iran sanctions mm -hmm. and whether or not it could be extended at some point or if there's talk of other countries like China that uses technology to keep tabs on distance. 
Well, I think the executive order specifically targets two countries uh, for their behavior uh, and their use of technology to um, engage in human rights abuse. Uh, I don't have I, the executive order order targets those two countries. Uh, it does not um, include other countries within it, but uh, you know we obviously. Uh, have a very clear stand on human rights abuses writ large by uh, all countries. And uh, this specific executive order has to do with two countries and their behavior and their use of technology to suppress their own people. Amy, last one. Trip this week to the colleges, the Romney campaign has sort of seized on the, this data of basically saying that um, a lot of young people are unemployed. Are you guys, how are you guys responding to that? You know, I saw that report, and, and the logical conclusion of that critique is that they believe Americans shouldn't get educated because it's not worth it. And there's not a single economist with a degree worth more than the paper it's printed on who would agree with that assessment. It is absolutely a fact that those who have college degrees are half as likely to be unemployed as those without. Now, there is no question that we continue to be uh, in a period of recovery from the worst recession since the Great Depression, a recession, uh, a terrible, terrible recession that led to uh, the loss of 8 million jobs, a terrible, terrible recession uh, that was precipitated in part by the policies of uh, the previous administration, uh, policies that some of the critics that you mentioned uh, want to return to in whole. I think that's a bad idea, and I think their assessment of the uh, value of education in the current economy is um, a little suspect. Thank you, Oliver. Oh, I don't want to uh, steal his thunder. So I urge you to listen to his speech. Thank you.